Today, we connect with a world-renowned immunologist who was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 1996. An Australian immunologist and professor at the University of Melbourne, Peter C. Doherty's Nobel Prize-winning research revealed how our immune systems recognise virally infected cells. And his institute, the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity, was the first outside China to sequence the COVID-19 genome, grow the virus and share the findings internationally. Today, we asked Dr. Doherty about the global response to COVID-19 and his take on how we can best fight the virus and quickly end this pandemic. Thank you so much for joining us today, sir. No, it's a pleasure. Well, my first question to you, uh, what has surprised you about COVID-19 compared to the other epidemics that you've observed um, in your time? Well, we've never seen any, I, I haven't seen anything quite like this in my lifetime, of course. We've written a lot in the past about the 1918-1919 Spanish influenza, but this is the first uh, really true pandemic I've lived through, though we've declared pandemics before. So it's um, been surprising in many ways. I wrote a book about pandemics, um, pandemics what everyone needs to know back in 2013. And so I understood um, a lot of the science behind it and what scientists would do and some of the economic impacts but I hadn't really understood the social and, uh, and broader economic impacts of a pandemic and the effects of social isolation and all the rest of it. So it's been a very steep learning curve for me, just as it has for everybody else. And as you said, there have been various social and economic ramifications uh, from this pandemic. And what do you think about countries reopening their economies despite not entirely having flattened the curve? I think that could be very dangerous if we're thinking, for instance, of the situation in the United States. But as I know the United States reasonably well, and I think various states will do different things at different times because there's no central uh, uh, guidance, um, I think we'll see a number of different experiments. We're already seeing that in effect, and some states have done much better than others. Of course, we look to uh, South Korea really as an example of a uh, country that has done very well with the pandemic and has been dealing with these issues of opening up and very interested to see the clips that preceded this and the discussion about face masks on public transit and so forth. That uh, seems a very good idea. Well, countries like South Korea and Australia, they've been really going, put, um, putting out all our efforts there to contain the virus. But countries like Sweden, for instance, they've been claiming relative success with their herd immunity experiment. But at the same time, it's among the 10 countries with the highest number of deaths per capita. Would you say that herd immunity is advisable at this point? And could it actually even protect people against a more deadly second wave of COVID-19? And we think that um, herd immunity, in the sense that numbers of people infected uh, massively decreasing the incidence of new disease, is likely to cut in when about 60% of people have been infected. We're not totally sure of that, but that's what we think will be the number. It could be higher, uh, not likely to be much lower. So you have to have a lot of uh, disease and death to before you really get to that stage. So we're really hoping that a herd immunity will be herd immunity, which is uh, people who have been infected and are immune, augmented by vaccination, and that will bring up that level of herd immunity rapidly with vaccines. Well, it does cause some to wonder, though, with countries like South Korea and your country, Australia, having managed to greatly contain and lower community infection cases, um, does that actually mean that we're more vulnerable to a second wave, as the majority of us have no immunity to this virus? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we are much more vulnerable because we've got a much more uh, previously unexposed population. So we've, we've avoided uh, the, the, the terrifying experience of having large numbers of people dying, the type of thing that's been happening in Brazil and parts of South America where people are terrified. Um, so we've avoided that, but of course our population is vulnerable. At the moment, uh, anyone coming into Australia on an international flight is quarantined for two weeks under government supervision in a hotel. And I don't think, uh, no Australians can leave Australia without special permission. And we're now discussing what we do about interstate travel uh, some borders are being still maintained because some of our states, we have a federal system, some of our states have had no cases for some time. 
So really, the more contained this virus is, actually, the more vulnerable we could be to a yeah. second wave. Then how would you advise countries like South Korea or Australia to ride out a potentially deadlier second wave? Well, to some extent, we're following you because you've done extremely well and you've been ahead of us in this. We never had a large numbers of infections here because uh, we, are, we are a bit remote, even though we think we have a lot of tourism, nothing like what they have in Europe and the United States. We never had the large uh, high level of background infection that got going in, the, in Europe and the US before people really started to react. We reacted very quickly, had tests out there very quickly and, uh, and were careful very quickly. And, so, and also we shut down. Uh, not totally. We've had construction workers out there, some other workers, and people have been able to go out for a walk and so forth. We're just easing off that now, and we'll follow exactly the same strategy you've been following of uh, contact tracing and testing. Um, probably not quite as well-disciplined a population as South Korea. Uh, we're much more diverse, so we'll see how it goes and, and how well that will work for us. Well, it seems that we can't really put our guards down until a vaccine is developed and really the question on, ev question on everyone's lips is when a vaccine would be available. What, what do you think? The, um, the earliest, uh, there are about, we've just heard that another vaccine has started phase one trial in Australia, an American vaccine. A phase one trial is simply uh, looking to see whether it, uh, the vaccine itself does any damage without infection and whether it good, gives a good antibody response, which is what we need. So um, I know of at least now five or six vaccines that are in humans at this stage. Uh, the most advanced, as I've un I understand it, is the Jenner Institute vaccine from Oxford, which is um, in about 600 people in the UK. But I think they're having a bit of trouble uh, because what they want here is for people who are vaccinated to actually be exposed to the infection. They're not exposing them deliberately, but they want them exposed in the community. But I think they're doing it around Oxford and there's not a lot of infection. So they may have to test that in a more uh, a situation where there's a lot more disease around. Um, they were hoping that they would be through the testing phase by about October, I think. And uh, they're already having 60 million doses of that vaccine produced in India. So they could be vaccinating later this year. Uh, our own estimates, um, we do have a vaccine under development here, which looks better, I must say, than any of the, just on very preliminary tests, than any of those out there that we've seen data on. But uh, we would not expect that to get that into a large numbers of people before, I think, uh, mid-2021. Uh, mid now, of course, if there's another promising vaccine out there that can be produced very quickly and in large quantities, and that's the problem uh, a lot, is not just testing its production, then we might uh, take that up. But I don't know. We haven't had to confront that yet. Well, as you said, your institute, uh, the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity, you've been collaborating with the University of Queensland as well on a vaccine candidate. And your institute was actually the first outside China to sequence the COVID-19 genome and share your findings internationally. How were you able to respond so quickly? Um, well, we've always been very open uh, about international science collaboration. Um, I'm not running the Institute. I'm the patron of the Institute. It's much younger and smarter people running it than I am. I'm too old to be doing that. But um, yes, we are collaborating very closely with the University of Queensland effort. Now, that's an effort that was uh, funded by an organisation called CEPI, the, CEP, uh, the Coalition of Epidemic Preparedness Initiatives, as I recall. And it's been funding uh, research on novel vaccine platforms for the last two years. It's um, Gates Foundation and various other people, WHO, um, some governments, I think, philanthropists. And uh, so they were ready to go uh, very, very quickly because they just slotted this new information, that is the information of the virus pro for the virus protein. Once we got the gene sequence from China, which was 9 January, they, they made that very quickly and it's, it's going through animal testing at the moment. It looks to be a terrific vaccine, actually, on the early testing, but we'll just have to see how it goes uh, in virus challenge experiments and then in human trials. So we were all able to get into this very quickly because of the status of modern molecular technology and because we have a very focused institute that uh, combines both the academic and basic science 
and the very practical aspects of, of uh, infectious disease in the community. So we've moved fast on it and uh, been great, uh, it's been great to collaborate with these people. We're, we're also collaborating with other people trying to screen for antiviral drugs. Uh, we have other vaccine candidates in development and so forth. Well, while scientists like yourselves are really rushing to develop this vaccine that will hopefully end this pandemic, we, it looks like we're going to have to uh, rely on the leadership of our leaders. But really the response, the global response to this pandemic, um, most of our, the, the most powerful leaders in the world today, their response seems to have been muddled, uh, to say the least. Um, and really, well, that has really compromised the health and lives of many people and medical staff as well. Would you have any uh, words of advice or even a warning to leaders who are giving out mixed signals today? I, I don't think that they're going to listen to anyone like me. They certainly haven't listened to the World Health Organization, which has really put out pretty clear signals, so it's been heavily criticized. Uh, it, it's uh, political realities in different countries and the way the way their political systems are weighted, as we understand. And, uh, and I think, uh, in general, uh, the Asian countries have done much better than some of the Western countries. Partly that's because I think you had the earlier experience of SARS, and partly because I think you're capable of mobilizing the country. And that's, we've got different models, obviously. The China model is very different from your model, but you're both very effective at uh, getting things done, as should be say. Um, I've been very pleasantly surprised that our country, which is at times a somewhat chaotic democracy, as many of these others are, has responded so strongly and so well. We've also had the advantage of being an island nation and, uh, and, uh, and being able to secure our borders. But uh, I've been very impressed by what we've done and uh, very grateful to our political leaders for acting it and very responsibly. New Zealand has also done wonderfully well. So what we really do need is a very clear and um, clear response, uh, a clear guidance from those who are leading our countries. Well, we'll have to let you go now, but thank you so much, Dr. Doherty, for your insights and for taking the time to share these crucial facts with people around the world. Peter C. Doherty, yeah, immunologist and professor at the University of Melbourne and Nobel Laureate of Physiology or Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. This is also where we wrap up the show. Thank you for watching. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with more global insights on issues making headlines. Have a good one wherever you are. Bye-bye.